Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of A Vision for You. Today is Sunday, July 12, 2015. My name is Leah, and I'm your moderator. The share ID for Friday, July 10th, is 7819. That's 7819. This morning, A Vision for You presents Chapter 6, Into Action. If we have taken steps three and four and decided to put the program of recovery to the test, we are ready to go into action. That just happens to be the title of chapter six, Into Action. In this chapter, we are given the directions, the prayers, and the promises for steps five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and 11. One of the amazing qualities of this program is its simplicity. We are told how to make our decision to begin recovery on page 63. From page 64 through page 83, we are told what we must do to be assured of a spiritual awakening. Once we have taken the action outlined in the pages, we are told we are now recovered. To maintain that miracle and to continue to grow spiritually and enlarge our spiritual life, we are told how we can take care of the moment by applying step 10 and how to gain the power and knowledge of his will for us by practicing step 11. That precious and vital information is contained in just five pages. Having followed the clear-cut directions presented in the 24 pages of Chapter 6, we are promised that we will have a spiritual awakening and have a solution for all our problems, not just the problem of compulsive overeating, but all our problems. The only way to see if that will prove true for us, as it did for the recovered alcoholics who pen these pages of this book, is to do what they report they did. With step four, we have taken only the first action step. Now it is time for action and more action. Joining us this morning to take a close look at Chapter 6 into action and develop its contents is Harlan G. Harlan is a recovered compulsive overeater dedicated to our 12-step program and intensively working with other compulsive overeaters. And it's with great gratitude that I welcome Harlan to the line once again. Thank you very much, Leah. And as we look at Chapter 6 on page 72 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the very first thing that comes to my mind is the title of the chapter. And it says, Into Action. Now, those of you who have heard me in the past and those of you who have not, I'm going to say this because this is, my, this is definitely my mantra. This is not a program for people who need it. This is not a program for people who want it. This is a program for people who do it. This is an action program. And now we are going to take our program out of ourselves and bring things to another human being And these things are going to be calling us back to where it all started, how it all started. And what we have here in step five, which is the first of the action steps that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about where the steps came from here for just a second. The steps came from the Oxford Group Movement. And one of the proponents of the, one of the chief people that was very influential on Bill Wilson ran the cavalry mission in New York City, and his name was Sam Shoemaker. Sam was very influential in the steps. He was very influential in the book. He was very influential in the earliest, earliest beginnings of the New York Fellowship. And Sam Shoemaker said many, many times and wrote in a book that was published 16 years before the big book was written, he said that there were four impediments to God. An impediment is something that slows or stops progress. Impediments to God. The first thing is a resentment that you will not let go of. And we covered that in Chapter 4. We're going to cover it again this morning in Chapter 10. Excuse me, in Step 10. 
and step 11. He also said that the second thing is a secret that you will not tell. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning in step five. He also said that if you will not let go of a vicarious thrill, now when we say a vicarious thrill, we're not talking about petting your dog or or fishing or tennis or golf or whatever it is you like to do. We're talking about the thrill you get from lying or stealing or cheating because those were very exciting things for me. And the fourth thing is a restitution that you will not make. And we're going to be talking about that this morning as well. Page 72, having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator, and to discover the obstacles in our path. We have admitted certain defects. We have ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We have put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory, and we did that when we took step four. Now these are about to be cast out. This requires action on our part, and I always accentuate the, accentuate the word action, which when completed will mean that we have admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step of the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing our defects with another person. We think we have done well enough in admitting these things to ourselves. There is doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Now, this solitary self-appraisal being insufficient is probably one of the understatements of the year. Because in my mind, it just makes perfect sense that I think a certain way about a certain event or person. In my mind, I have to remember that I am a liar and that when I look at a particular film or I look at a particular television program or I listen to a particular podcast here on A Vision for You, it is the same because these recordings have fidelity, truth, consistency, which I lack. Because when I develop a resentment against, say, Sam, and I resent Sam for doing something that did not stick to my script and brought about my fear, brought about my anger, every time I replay that resentment against Sam, I change it just a little bit. And I make his part just a bit more dastardly and my part just a little more innocent. And every single time I play that resentment against Sam, I look a little better, and he looks a little worse. And at the end of that time, I was standing there doing nothing, and he came along, and he did me dirt. And that looks so real in my mind that I begin to believe it. So a solitary self-appraisal proving insufficient to me is one of the understatements of the year. I must bring this to another person. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. We will be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should do so. And this is where so many of us fall down as sponsors. We don't explain to people why we do these things. And we do these things so that they can see the light of day. Not the person to see the light of day, that too, but so that the facts or these facts, and I say that in quotes, these events will see the light of day so that they can be bounced off an objective person so that we can get a more clear-cut picture of our role in things and how we have hurt other people. The best reason first, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. I have to have a very, very good idea of why I'm doing these things. And it tells me that right on the previous page. It says, excuse me, time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. 
trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. If I hold back, I'm going to eat again. And the fear of more eating in me outweighs the fear of letting the food go. And that is when recovery can take place. The fear of more eating, more destruction, must outweigh the fear of letting the food go. It must, or I will not take these actions. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. And one of the things that I thank God for every day is for people that I hear on A Vision for You. And people, and I can't wait to meet some of you at the convention in Virginia Beach. I hope you're going to come if you're listening. If you can, all, if you can at all make it, I, I hope to meet some of you there. I'm excited about it, and I'm really looking forward to that convention in Virginia Beach that's coming up in October. But we have metamorphosized as, a, as an OA program. When I came in in 1979 in Chicago, we took this sentence about all their life story and started writing prenatal inventories, which had nothing to do with compulsive overeating. And we started doing autobiographies. And I remember on a Chicago Saturday afternoon, taking some poor sap out to a park in Chicago and reading that poor guy my autobiography And at the end of reading him my autobiography, I guarantee neither I nor he was any further away from a candy bar than we were before we started because it revealed nothing. But if I have heard your fourth step in a form of a fifth step, I know your life story. If I hear your resentments and I hear your fears and I hear your sexual harms done others, I'll probably know more about you than your best friends. More than most people, continuing on page 73. The alcoholic leads a double life. There's another understatement. He is very much the actor. To the outer world, he presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. Because we don't feel good about ourselves when we're in this illness. We don't feel good about ourselves when we're keeping secrets. We don't feel good about ourselves when we're full of fear and resentment and we're full of food. We just don't. The inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he is revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. These memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed him. As fast as he can, he pushes these memories far inside of himself. He hopes they will never see the light of day. This illness flourishes in darkness and withers in sunlight. I am as sick as my secrets. You've all heard that. You've all heard that at meetings. Because it is fear. It is dishonesty and fear mingling together with my self-seeking and my selfishness where I will keep these secrets and those are defects of character that will trigger the mental twist. The twist of the mind will catapult me into the food in search of a desire to feel better, and that effect from the food is what I'm looking for. He hopes they will never see the light of day. He is under constant fear and tension. That makes for more drinking, and we just talked about that. Psychologists are inclined to agree with us. We have spent thousands of dollars for examination. We know but few instances where we have given these doctors a fair break. We have seldom told them the whole truth, nor have we followed their advice. Unwilling to be honest with these sympathetic men, we were honest with no one else. Small wonder, many in the medical profession have a low opinion of alcoholics and their chance of recovery. We must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world. Now, do I need a stronger warning than the last part of 73 where it says we must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world? Remember that one of the things we're taught is that we're as sick as our secrets. 
Sam Shoemaker said that one of the impediments to God is a secret that we will not tell. And I don't want to get too far off on a tangent here because of time. But what I also have to remember is that for the compulsive overeater, food is never the problem. I'm going to say that again. Maybe some of you have not heard me say that before. To the compulsive overeater, food is never the problem. Food is the answer to the problem. What is the problem then? The problem is the intense, searing, unbearable pain that comes about in the life of a compulsive overeater when we are not eating. And where does that pain come from? The buildup of human emotion. And when these emotions build to the level where they become too painful for us, the emotional part of the brain knocks on the door of the mental twist and says, do you have a solution for this? The mental twist rises from its lethargy and says, oh, yes, I do. And it's a Kit Kat bar or a cupcake or French fries or what have you. And the mental twist drives me irresistibly to the food in search of a relief from this pain. And that's where the disease lives. Continuing, page 74. Rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose the person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. Those of us belonging to a religious denomination, which requires confession, must and, of course, will want to go to the properly appointed authority whose duty it is to receive it. Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with somebody ordained by an established religion. We often find such a person quick to see and understand our problem. Of course, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. Now, you don't have to take this to a religious body, a, a, a clergyman, but it's telling you in this paragraph that you can, and it's fine, and it's not a problem. If we cannot, cannot or would not rather do this, rather not do this, excuse me, we search our acquaintance for a closed-mouth understanding friend. Perhaps our doctor or psychologist will be the person. It may be one of our own family, but we cannot disclose anything to our wives or our parents, which will hurt them and make them unhappy. We have no right to save our own skin at another person's expense. Such parts of our story we tell to someone who will understand yet be unaffected. And this is a very important sentence here. Let's just say, for example, sorry, I got a focaccia allergy here. Let's just say, for example, that I work with Mary. Mary and I are co-workers. We work in the next uh, desk from one another. We've been friends for years. And you're married to Mary. I am not the person to hear your fifth step because I'm going to hear things about Mary that I really don't want to hear, shouldn't hear. I'm going to be affected. And the other part of it is we tell our story to someone who will understand. And for me, that means, for me, that they have to have an understanding of this program. So they have to understand yet be unaffected. And that's a lot easier to find today than it was in 37 and 38 when the book was written, 39 when it came out, April of 39. The rule is we must be hard on ourselves, but always considerate of others. And the key word there is always considerate of others. Notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be one who is so, is so uh, sorry, notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be one who is so situated that there is no suitable person available. If that is so, this step may be postponed only, however, if we hold ourselves in complete readiness to go through with it at the first opportunity. We must be ready to move forward. And God in his infinite wisdom may hesitate me in those situations, although in today's world it really shouldn't be that hard at all. But then I'm willing, I'm ready, I'm ready to go when that opportunity comes. We say this because we are very anxious that we talk to the right person. It is important that he be able to keep a confidence, that he fully understand and approve what we are driving at, that he will not try to change our plan, but we must not use this as a mere excuse to postpone. When we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. Very clear instruction. When we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. And you hear people over and over again, 
they're taking a step a year, they're taking a step a century, whatever that is. No, the big book is very clear. We waste no time. Do it now. We have, we have a written inventory, and we are prepared for a long talk. We explain to our partner what we are about to do and why we have to do it. He should realize that we are engaged upon a life and death errand. Most people approached in this way will be glad to help. They will be honored by our confidence. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step with holding nothing. Now let's take a look at the language here in this paragraph. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character. The key word there is every. Every dark cranny of the past. Again, the key word is every. Once we have taken this step with holding what? Something? No, nothing. Now, some of you may be out there thinking, gosh, I, I better wait till I'm perfect. No, do the best you can. But don't withhold anything consciously. Go for it. You have nothing to lose but the food. You have nothing to lose but the obsession. You have nothing to lose, then your old self will run riot life. We are delighted. Withholding nothing, it says, we are delighted. There's a, there's a promise of this program. You don't have to wait for page 83. There it is. Withholding nothing. We are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we are beginning, we begin, <clears throat> excuse me, to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly, and that was the case for me. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. I feel good when I take these steps. I feel good. And the, the, the person that I was in this illness, I did not know how to look the world in the eye. I knew how to look up at you and envy you and be jealous of you. And I knew how to decide in my mind that somehow you were lucky and me not so much. That somehow you got a thin, beautiful body, be you man, be you woman, be you whatever, and that you had breaks in life that somehow I was cheated out of. I knew how to look up at you, and I knew how to look down at you and judge you as stupid and idiotic and whatever. I knew how to judge you, and I knew how to persecute you in my mind and look down at you but I did not know how to look at you and embrace you mentally or embrace you physically to know you too are a human being. I did not know how to be another bozo on the bus. I knew how to drive the bus. I knew how to sit in the back of the bus feeling sorry for myself, but I did not know how to be another bozo on the bus. And when I take this step, I feel human, and I feel your humanity as well. And it allows me to love you. It allows me to accept you, and it allows me to help you. It allows me to be what I was born to be, which was another human being on earth. And that's very important for me. And when it says that broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe, I perceived God as being inaccessible to somebody like me who had yelled F you at my mother. I perceived God as somebody who I could not get to because I had ridden my bicycle on Saturday, because I had eaten food that wasn't kosher because I had done things like lie and cheat and steal and fake sick so I didn't have to go to school, and I had done these things, so I assumed at some point that there were people that were religious enough to get to God and those who were not, and so as long as I couldn't get to God, I might as well eat what I want, do what I want, and, you know, I couldn't live that way anymore. It was too painful. And then the book says to me, walking hand in hand, excuse me, we feel one on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Now I can embrace God, and now I can pray that he will embrace me and know that it will be so. Now there are two things I know about God. 
And there are theologians this morning and poets, musicians, artists, clergymen who are going to philosophize today about who God is and who God is not and what God is and what God is not. I bless them in their efforts, in their endeavors. There are only two things I need to know about God. There is one, and it's not me. And so this broad highway opens up that door to me. Now, here's your basic instruction, your specific instruction. It's going to give you an hour off because we're going to move very quickly after this. We're going to move very quickly before this. But it says here, returning home. I'm on the bottom of 75. Returning home, we can find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. It doesn't say anything about being quiet for, for three months. It doesn't say anything about being quiet for a year. It doesn't say anything about being quiet one person said for 72 days. I almost fainted when I heard that one. Where did they get that? I don't know. But it says quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. Now, I get very quiet in that hour. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Notice your capitals here. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals. What are the first five proposals? They're the first five steps, aren't they? We ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement with it put into the foundation? that we try to make mortar without sand. Now, after an hour, not a year, not a month, we turn the page. If we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. We are now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable. Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. Now, this is a very important step. Don't poo-poo it by just running into the seven-step prayer. Because I have to ask myself very important questions. <laughs> Excuse me. Am I willing to operate my business without lying and stealing? Am I willing to operate my life with honesty? Guys, I lied when the truth would have served me better. I wrote bad checks. I lied. I hurt people. I cut every corner I could possibly cut in life. I tried to outmaneuver, outmanipulate those people around me so I could gain ground on what I felt I wanted, needed, and deserved. Am I willing to trust God? Because if I'm willing to trust God, that means I have to live my life in honesty. And that's so hard for a person like me. I lied when the truth would have been better. And remember that we are taught that one of the impediments to God is a vicarious thrill that I will not let go of. Lying, stealing, cheating, manipulating are thrilling when I'm in my illness. When I am ready, when ready, we say something like this, my creator, you can say it with me if you want to. I won't be able to hear you, but you can say it with me at home or in the car. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. We have completed step seven. So in a very short period of time in this chapter, we have done five, six, and seven. Now we need more thinking, hoping, praying. Nope. We need more action. This is not a program for people who want it. This is not a program for people who need it. This is a program for people who do it. Now we need more action without which we find that faith without works is dead. That's Ann Smith's favorite Bible verse. Ann Smith was married to Dr. Bob, and Dr. Bob was the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Let's look at steps eight and nine 
We have a list of persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. Now, again, this narishkeit, which is a Yiddish word for foolishness, a nar is a fool, a narishkeit is foolishness, about burning your fourth step. Please, don't burn your fourth step. You're going to need it for step eight and nine. Don't burn your, there's no, somebody show me in the book where it says now we burn the sucker. It doesn't say that because you're going to need this information. We, t- we made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Who do we ask? We ask God in prayer to give us that willingness to make these amends if we could. Remember, it was agreed at the beginning, we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. And that calls us back to page 58. And on page 58, it says very simply, if you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, dash, then you are ready to take certain steps. And this is repeating that same theme, that same ideal. Now, I want to talk for just a minute here about step eight, because every time I go to a step study meeting, invariably when the subject is step eight, we're really talking most of the meeting about step nine. But step eight is a vital and crucial step. And the reason that it's vital and crucial is because it establishes willingness to do so, just like step six, six and eight are parallels. I hated my mother with a purple passion. My mother was mentally ill. My mother had three distinct personalities. She could be a three-year-old. She could be a screaming, raving lunatic, or she could be one of the most together, well-read, articulate individuals you ever talked to in your life. You never knew which personality was coming at any given time, and there was no rhyme or reason for the personality either coming or going away. And it seemed that these personalities would rear their ugly head at the most inopportune times to embarrass the daylights out of me. I wanted Rob and Laura Petrie for parents. I wanted young, energetic, American parents that could sing and dance and were rich and lived in houses and with backyards, and I wanted a pony and all this, and I didn't get it. I didn't really want a pony, but I figured it would, you know, it would illustrate. And I got something very different. I got Max and Virginia Grabowski. And my mother and her mental illness became the bane of my existence, and I blamed her for everything. There was nothing in my life that was not her fault, from my obesity to the fact that I didn't go on a date with a girl, to the fact that I had no money, to the fact that I had to take care of them at a very early age. When I was five and six years old, I became the parent and they became the children. My father was 54 years old when I was born. And I blamed her for everything. And she died in 1976, just a few years before I came into program. So I never had the maturity. I never had the opportunity. I never had the, 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 the wherewithal to make any type of, men, of amends to my mother. And then I came into program in 1979, and I started working these steps. And I had deep-seated, deep-seated hatred of her. And it took me years of inventorying and years of program and years of prayer and years of meetings to come to the conclusion that I didn't choose her. And then something happened on December the 14th, 1994. On December the 14th, 1994, my daughter was born. My daughter was born in Eugene, Oregon, where we lived for nine years. When we were a we, we lived there for nine years. We're divorced now, but she's still my daughter. (laughs) 
But the bottom line is, once she was born and she had to be taken into the neonatal intensive care unit there because she came into the world under very horrible conditions health-wise for her and for my ex-wife. And she was in the neonatal intensive care unit. And she was about five minutes, ten minutes old. And I walked her in there. I carried her into that NICU at, at the hospital there, Sacred Heart Hospital in Eugene, Oregon. And they were hooking up medicine to her feet and her head. And all of a sudden, a building fell on me. Bang! And I got it, and I said, Ma, I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry. I now get it. I understand how much I hurt you. And for the first and only time in my life, I understood that not only had I not chosen this mother who was mentally ill, but that she hadn't chosen her mental illnesses either, And I stopped looking at what I had lost by having a mentally ill mother, and I started looking at what she had lost by having an ungrateful bastard. Pan's already there. What are you looking? What are you doing? They want pancakes. Somebody's talking on the line. I don't know who. Okay. Continuing on page 76. Probably there are still some misgivings. As we look over the list of business acquaintances and friends we have hurt, we may feel diffident about going to some of them on a spiritual basis. Hesitant. Let us be reassured to some people we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual feature on our first approach. We might prejudice them at the moment we are trying to put our lives in order. This is not an end in itself. Now, the next sentence here is going to tell me why I was born into this world. It's going to tell me everything I need to know. It's going to say here, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service, that's an Oxford group term, to God and the people about us. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. That's why I'm here. That's why I was born. That's why I survived the unrelenting curse of what I lived in, the loneliness, the physical pain of weighing 400, 500, 600, 700 pounds, the contact dermatitis, being emasculated physically and emotionally, being cast to the side as a freak. People would yell things at me from cars. Children would laugh at me. People would see me and they would point at me and laugh. People would come up to me and say, do you know how fat you are? And I'd say, no, why don't you tell me about it? No, I didn't say that. But that was a hell of an existence. I couldn't wear underpants. I had towels shoved between layers of flab to keep it from rubbing together. I couldn't walk. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. My life was hell. And I'm here today, and I can walk, and I can breathe, and I can function because of a God that is powerful and merciful. And all he's asking me to do is to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. In the Oxford group, they would say, are you being maximum? And they would say to Bill Wilson, go get us some stockbrokers. And Bill would say, I have a vision of sobering up drunks. And they say, no, 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 get us some stockbrokers. Well, what did the stockbrokers have that the drunks didn't have? Money. Yeah, right, money. And he said, no, I'm going to be of maximum service with these drunks. And so this is a shout out to them. Continuing, page 77. It is seldom wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce we have gone religious. In the prize ring, this would be called leading with the chin. Why lay ourselves open to being branded fanatics or religious force? We may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message. But our man is sure to be impressed with a sincere desire to set, <clears throat> excuse me, to set right the wrong. He is going to be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than in our talk of spiritual discoveries. So getting back to the subject of my mother, which is somebody I can't make amends to because she's dead. 
She'd been dead since 1976. I didn't come in until February of 79. How do I make amends to a mother that loved me through her limitations by being of maximum service to God and the people about me? I've traveled this country up and back many, many times doing big book retreats, doing big book weekends. I've done them as far northwest as Anchorage, Alaska, and as far south as Boca Raton, Florida. I've done them as far northeast as Waltham, Massachusetts, as far southwest as San Diego, California. I just got done doing one at the Region 2 convention in San Diego, California, which was a delightful, delightful weekend for me, reacquainting myself with so many of the friends down there. And when I travel this country or when I sponsor or I show up at a meeting or I do anything that is consistent with this, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us, I know that my mother is pleased. I know that my mother loved me and she wanted me to live in the sunlight of the spirit just like I would want for my daughter. That's what she wanted for me. And I love my mother. And I couldn't love her during her life. I'm sorry about that. I couldn't really love her during her life here on earth with me and her. It never worked. But now it does. And I feel her spirit with me whenever I do things that are of service. Sometimes that phone rings and somebody wants me to go here or they want me to go there. Sometimes I don't really want to do it. (laughs) But when I do... I feel her with me. When I do my walking, my swimming, when I operate my business, when I take care of my dog, when I'm loving toward my friends, I feel her with me. And I know that she accepts my amends. And that's a lot to know. That's a lot to know. Continuing page 77, we don't use this as an excuse for shying away from the subject of God when it will serve any good purpose. We are willing to announce our convictions with tact and common sense. There's nothing in there about being an evangelist, is there? With tact and common sense. I don't mind telling anybody, yes, I'm a member of Overeaters Anonymous, and yes, I believe in God, and yes, it is by the grace of God that I'm alive today on July the 12th, 2015. It is only by the grace of God that I have not eaten compulsively in 16 and a half years, nor have I wanted to, nor have I wanted to. The question of how to approach the man we hated will arise. It may be he has done us more harm than we have done him, and though we, have, we may have acquired a better attitude toward him, we are still not too keen about admitting our fault. Nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to an enemy than to a friend, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. These are very specific instructions. Under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. Simply we tell him we will never get over drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past. We are there to sweep off our side of the street, realizing that nothing worthwhile can be accomplished until we do so, never trying to tell him what he should do. His faults are not discussed. This is a very specific instruction. And that is why I urge everyone listening here, do not run around going on ninth step calls without an understanding sponsor. When I say understanding, I mean someone who understands the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you can actually do more harm by running around doing nine-step amends without that guidance. That's why we need a sponsor. His faults are not discussed. We stick to our own. If our manner is calm, frank, and open, we will be gratified with the result. If your manner is obnoxious, if your manner is, I'm just here because I have to be and I still hate you, if your manner is something other than <clears throat> excuse me, calm, frank, and open, you won't be gratified with the result. You're not going to get the result that you want. 
You may not get it anyway, and that's okay. There's no guarantee here that the person is going to embrace you and say, oh, that's okay, I love you anyway. There's no guarantee of that. Some of the people I had to make amends to didn't like me much before. They, don't, they didn't like me then, and they don't like me now, and that's okay. I'm there to clean off my side of the street. In nine cases out of ten, the unexpected happens. Sometimes the man we are calling upon admits his own fault, so feuds of years standing melt away in an hour. Rarely do we fail to make satisfactory progress. Our former enemies sometimes praise what we are doing and wish us well. Occasionally they will offer assistance. It should not matter, however. If someone does throw us out of his office, we have made our demonstration, done our part. It is water over the dam. All I need to do is make that approach. If they don't want to make amends to me, or they don't want to take my amends, excuse me, then they don't have to. I was married for 17 and a half years. I did not want the divorce. It was five years ago. I didn't want it. But I had to go back and make amends to my ex-wife for the things I had done that harmed her, and she would not let me do that. That's okay. That's her prerogative. I am at the ready should that chance present itself. There's nothing I can do to force her to take my amends. I cannot rope her and say, now listen and, and, and don't speak. No, I can't do that. Mm-mm. Okay. Most alcoholics owe money. Now, there's one of the other understatements of the year. Now, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a compulsive overeater. But in my illness, I wrote a lot of bad checks. During the 1970s, my food habit, not my hooker habit, cocaine habit, heroin habit, gambling habit, my food habit was about 100 to $150 a day. I ate every waking moment of the day. I ran from restaurant to restaurant, from convenience store to convenience store. I went from hither to yon, from yon to hither, eating constantly. Now, my income was nowhere near that. I wrote tens of thousands of dollars worth of bad checks. And if you're out there and you have these money issues and you say to yourself, I could never pay that amount back. I didn't pay it all in one hunk. I paid it in increments. And there was an amends that I had to make, a money amends that I had to make to a dentist. He wasn't really a dentist. He was one of these guys that does root canal. I think it's called something. I, I can't think of it now. It's only, I can't think of it now. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He does root canal work, and he was in Chicago where I was born and raised. And I went to him one day because I needed some root canal, and the regular dentist said, you need to go to this guy. And that's fine. He was right in my neighborhood, and that was okay. And I went in there. And the very first thing he says to me is, wow, how fat are you? How much do you weigh? The very first thing he said to me was, God, you're fat, or how much do you weigh? And he started yelling about his chair. And he says he had just had his chair fixed, but the, the weight capacity on the chair was only 500 pounds or 300 pounds, and I was well above that at that time. I was probably over 600 pounds at the time I visited this dentist. And sure enough, I broke his chair as luck would have it. And he started screaming at the top of his lungs at me and at his daughter that she should never take an appointment from me again and that I am never to come back to his office and he's going to complete his work and he is going to send me to another person. I am never to darken his door again. Now I'm numb in the mouth and I'm numbed out emotionally because that's the only thing I knew to do was to shut down emotionally and withstand the onslaught of the abuse. I had been practiced at taking abuse because I'd been taking it since I was five years old, four years old. People were screaming at me about my weight from the time I was in kindergarten. Now, I had dental insurance at this time, but my copay on this was $62. Well, you know what this guy could do for $62. Years go by. Now I'm in program again because I had left and now I'm back. Now it's 1986 I came back and I have to make amends to this guy. And I keep pushing him back to the end of the line. And finally my sponsor says, you need to make amends to Dr. P. 
I says, oh, boy. One day, about a year and a half to two years after the incident where he yelled at me, a good two years, if not more, I went to the bank, and I got a 50, a 10, and two ones out of my account. $62 I owed this guy. I went across the street from the bank to his office, and his name was no longer on the door. I walked in, and there was his daughter. I recognized her. She did not recognize me. She says, wow, you've really lost a lot of weight. I refreshed her memory. She remembered the incident. And I gave her the $62, and she refused to take it. And I said to her, please take this money and give it to charity. Do with this money as you see fit. I want to give it to you so I can recover. And she took it gladly. We wished each other well. My tires did not hit the ground on the way home. And let me tell you that the very last thing on my mind that day was eating excess food. I had been lifted. I had been changed. I had been altered. I had had a spiritual awakening of a profound nature. So here this work is, and I recommend to anyone, do the work. You can't pay the money back in one lump hump sum. Or one lump sum. It's only 6.20 in the, 6.21 in the morning here, so you got to give me a little bit of a break here. You can't pay it all back in one lump sum. Start paying it back in increments. You were smart enough to steal it. You'll be smart enough to pay it back. Get started. Get started now, but don't get started without a sponsor. Do the work. Test God. See where you can find him lacking. I dare you to find him lacking. And in all the years that I had to pay back taxes, and in all the years that I had to pay back this money, I never missed a mortgage payment. I never missed a meal. I never missed a car payment. I never missed an electric payment or a gas payment or whatever. You can know in your mind that God will provide for you. Once you walk to him, he will run to you. Test him. You will not find him wanting. Let's continue. We do not guard our creditors. I'm on page 78. Most alcoholics owe money. We do not dodge our creditors, telling them what we are trying to do. We make no bones about our drinking. They usually know in any way whether we think so or not. Nor are we afraid of disclosing our alcoholism on the theory it may cause financial harm. Dr. Bob was a surgeon. He was a proctologist. And it was very frightening for him. Very frightening for him to disclose to people that he was an alcoholic, even though the only one in Akron that didn't think he was an alcoholic was him. And Dr. Bob, our co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, we get this impression at times that Dr. Bob got sober when he met Bill. No, that is not the case. He met Bill on Mother's Day, May 13, 1935. But he didn't get sober till June 10, 1935. Let's take a look very quickly for time's sake at what happened. Dr. Bob was going to a medical convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, in June of 35, after meeting Bill. And Ann Smith begged Bill, don't let him go. Don't let him go, Bill. He gets drunk there every year. Bill said, Ann, God has either removed Bob's desire for liquor or he has not. Sure enough, in a planned spree, Bob goes to the railroad station in Akron, and he's already drinking and he's drunk, goes to Atlantic City, stays drunk there for days. He comes back on June the 9th, 1935, and he shows up at the home of his nurse in Cuyahoga Falls, which is a suburb of Akron, Ohio. Dr. Bob is there, and he's drunk, and the nurse calls Ann Smith and says, Ann, you better come get him. He's boiled as an owl. He's absolutely four sheets to the wind. 
Bill Wilson and Ann Smith, they hop in the car and they go out and they get him on June the 9th, 1935. Now, the next day, June 10th, he has a surgery scheduled that he must do. Not only he was the only guy that could really do it, but he needed the money badly. And Dr. Bob wakes up and he is shaking. He's got the DTs. And Bill Wilson does something for Dr. Bob that a lot of AA sponsees wish their sponsors would do for them. He pours Bob a bottle of beer to get, get him quiet, get his nerves quiet so he can do the surgery. He takes Bob on June 10th, 1935, to the hospital. Not long ago, I visited that home and that hospital in Akron, Akron City Hospital. And I was much moved there. I hope that if you're listening to this one day, you'll go to Akron and you'll see his home and the hospital and everything too. It's quite in his grave. It's quite a moving experience. Bill Wilson makes a plan with Bob to meet him in the parking lot of the hospital when the surgery is done. Hours go by. No Bob. Bill goes back to the home on Ardmore Street to wait for Bob. No Bob. 11.45 in the evening. On June the 10th, 1935, Dr. Bob is walking down Ardmore Street in Akron, Ohio. And even though Bill Wilson assumed that the beer triggered the allergy and Bob was off to the races again, he was sober. He comes to the home. 455 Ardmore, and he is sober at 1145 in the evening, and he had just gone around Akron making restitution to the people that he had harmed. So powerful was his spiritual experience after making these amends, or what they then called restitution that he never found it necessary ever to drink in his life, and he died in November of 1950, never again having liquor. Now, if it worked for Bob, it'll work for you. This is powerful stuff. This is powerful stuff. Page 78, approached in this way, the most ruthless creditor will sometimes surprise us. Arranging the best deal we can, we let these people know we are sorry. Our drinking has made us slow to pay. We must lose our fear of creditors, no matter how far we have to go, for we are liable to drink if we are afraid to face them. And now in the next couple of pages, we're going to blow the doors off an oft-repeated mistake in OA. We're going to start doing step 10 the minute we begin steps 8 and 9. We are not going to wait until we're done with them because what's going to happen as we go through the amends process, emotions are going to build up. Fear and anger and dishonesty are going to build up, and we're going to use step 10 to dissipate those emotions so they do not build to the level where they drive us to the food. You do not wait till you're, be, where you, till you're done with step nine to begin 10 because we're going to read the line in step 10 on page 84 that we start step 10 when we commence to clean up the past, when we begin to clean up the past. If you don't have step two to lean on and 10, you will not go through with the process. And where you see people struggling in nine, where you see people struggling in four, you are really seeing people that are struggling with two. Two and ten are the trap doors. Don't work them, don't believe them, you won't recover. You have to see the need to do this, to do it. Where you see people struggling in nine, where you see people struggling in in four, you are really seeing people struggling in step two that they do not have a God that is personal to them. They do not have a power greater than themselves that they can lean on and hold hands with through the process. Many of us 
try to drag that hippopotamus through the dog door of a religious God that we didn't believe as children, that we didn't believe as adults, and we're going to still cling to that belief. And I'm not knocking religion. I'm not saying religion's fine. I have no no basis with which to criticize it. But I need a power greater than myself that is personal to me, that I am willing to believe in. I must be willing to believe in the power of that God, or I'm not going to do this. So if you're struggling in nine, you may be really struggling in two. Check it out with a good sponsor. Bottom of 78, perhaps we have committed a criminal offense, which might land us in jail if it were known to the authorities. We may be short in our accounts and unable to make good. We have already admitted this in confidence to another person, but we are sure we would be imprisoned or lose our job if it were known. Maybe it's only a petty offense, such as padding the expense account. Many, most of us have done that sort of thing. Maybe we are divorced and have remarried but haven't kept up the alimony to number one. She's indignant about it and has a warrant out for our arrest. That's a common form of trouble, too. Although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles which we find guiding. Reminding ourselves again, here we are referencing step zero again, reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. If you want what we have and you're willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. It's on page 58, and we just referenced it for the, for the second time in this chapter. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. We may lose our position or reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. And again, if I don't have step two, a power greater than myself that I'm willing to believe in, I will not do this. And when I start cutting corners, I'm going to start cutting cake. When I start cutting corners, I'm going to start unwrapping candy bars. When I start cutting corners, I'm going to start waiting at drive throughs impatiently for my tacos. It's that simple. But yet, it's that we have to have that belief. Usually, however, other people are involved. Therefore, we must not be the hasty and foolish martyr who would needlessly sacrifice others to save himself from the alcoholic pit. A man we know had remarried because of resentment and drinking. He had not paid alimony to his first wife. She was furious. She went to court and got an order for his arrest. He had commenced our way of life, had secured a position, and was getting his head above water. It would have been impressive, impressive heroics if he had walked up to the judge and said, here I am. We thought he ought to be willing to do that if necessary, but if he were in jail, he could provide nothing for either family. He, we suggested he write his first wife, admitting his fault and asking forgiveness. He did and also sent a small amount of money. He told her what he would try to do in the future. He said he was perfectly willing to go to jail if she insisted. Of course, she did not, and the whole situation has long been adjusted. Top of 80 before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we secured their consent. You were implicit in something with another person, you make sure they have, you have their permission before you go and, and do this. If you do not, have your, if do not have their permission, here's what it says. If we have obtained permission, have consulted with others, ask God to help, and, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. If you don't have it, you have to be willing to make these amends should that situation change. We do not have the right to save our skin at another person's expense. This brings us this brings to mind a story about one of our friends while drinking he accepted a small a sum of money from a bitterly hated business rival giving him no receipt for it. He subsequently denied having received the money and used the incident as a basis for discrediting the man. He thus used his own wrongdoing as a means of destroying the reputation of another. In fact his rival was ruined. He felt that he had done a wrong he could not possibly make right. If he opened that old affair, he was afraid it would destroy the reputation of his partner, disgrace his family, and take away his means of livelihood. What right had he to involve those dependent upon him? He could be, he could be possibly, uh, sorry, it's early here. How could he possibly make a public statement exonerating his rival? After consulting his wife and partner, he came to the conclusion that it was better to take those risks 
than to stand before his creator of such ruinous slander. He saw that he had to place the outcome in God's hands or he would soon start drinking again and all would be lost anyhow. He attended church for the first time in many years. After the sermon, he quietly got up and made an explanation. His action met widespread approval and today he is one of the most trusted citizens of his town. This all happened years ago. The chances are that we have domestic troubles. Perhaps we are mixed up with women in a fashion we wouldn't care to have advertised. Unfortunately, I didn't have these amends to make. I went on my first date when I was 35. And, uh, but anyway, I never kissed anybody's wife. Dang it. And I never kissed anybody's girlfriend. Darn it. But anyway, we doubt, top of 80, if this, we doubt if in this respect alcoholics are fundamentally much worse than other people. But drinking does complicate sex relations in the home. After a few years with an alcoholic, a wife gets worn out, resentful and uncommunicative. How could she be anything else? The husband begins to feel lonely, sorry for himself. He commences to look around in the nightclubs or perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, or, or their equivalent for something besides liquor. Perhaps he is having a secret and exciting affair with the girl who understands. In fairness, we must say that she may understand, but what are we going to do about a thing like that? A man so involved often feels very remorseful at times, especially if he is married to a loyal and courageous girl who has literally gone through hell for him. Whatever the situation, we usually have to do something about it. Again, action, do, is an action word, it's a verb. Do something about it. If we are not sure our wife, uh, if we are sure our wife does not know, should we tell her? Not always, we think. If she knows in a general way that we have been wild, should we tell her in detail? Undoubtedly, we should admit our fault. She may insist on knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. We feel we ought to say to her that we have no right to involve another person. We are sorry for what we have done, and God willing, it shall not be repeated. More than that, we cannot do. We have no right to go further, though there may be justifiable exceptions, and though we wish to lay down no rule of any sort, we have often found this the best course to take. Our design for living is not a one-way street. It is as good for the wife as for the husband. If we can forget, so can she. It is better, however, that one does not needlessly name a person upon whom she can vent jealousy. Perhaps there are some cases where the utmost frankness is demanded. No outsider can appraise such an intimate situation. It may be that both will decide that the way of good sense and loving kindness is to let bygones be bygones. Each might pray about it, having the other one's happiness uppermost in mind. Keep it always in sight that we are dealing with that most terrible human emotion, jealousy. Good generalship may decide that the problem be attacked on the flank rather than face a, than risk a face-to-face -face combat. If we have no such complication, there is plenty we should do at home. Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say that the only thing he needs to do is keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober, for there will be no home if he doesn't. But he is a long, yet a long way from making good to a wife or parents whom for years he has so shockingly treated, passing all understanding as the patients, mothers, and wives have had with alcoholics. Had this not been so, many of us would have no homes today, would perhaps be dead. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderable considerate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came up out of his cyclone cellar to find his home ruined to his wife. He remarked, don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing? Yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful mumbling that we are sorry won't fill the bill at all. We ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it, being very careful not to criticize them. Their defects may be glaring, but the chances are that their, our own actions are partly responsible. So we clean house with the family, asking each morning in meditation that our creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. <laughs> Excuse me. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. And again, that's in italics. This is not a program for people who need it. And it's not a program for people who want it. 
This is a program for people who do it. And this is a program for people who do it and 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 do it. I was in New Jersey not long ago, a couple of years ago, a place called Mount Laurel, I think, New Jersey. And there was a woman there, and she came up to me after the Saturday, one of the Saturday sessions. We were going to go to lunch. And she said to me, can I call you when I'm done with my steps? And I said, no. She looked at me very quizzically and said, why not? And I said, when you're done with your steps, you'll be dead. Because we continue to work these steps every day and dig deeper and deeper and deeper for God. We do what we need to do to improve our spiritual life. We expand our spiritual life. We do not rest on our laurels. Continuing. Unless one's family expresses a desire to live upon spiritual principles, what are the principles? The steps. We think we ought not urge them. We should not talk incessantly to them about spiritual matters. They will change in time. Our behavior will convince them more than our words. Behaviors change attitudes. Attitudes don't change behaviors. Do the program. Don't talk about the program. Live the program. Don't talk about the program. Work the program. Don't talk about the program. We must remember that 10 or 20 years of drunkenness would make a skeptic out of anybody. There may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would write them if we could. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter, and there may be a valid reason for postponement in some cases, but we don't delay if it can be avoided. We should be sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scraping. As God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. You were eating then. You were in your illness then. You're there to make amends. You're not there to be anybody's whipping boy. And it's no secret that in the infinite wisdom of this program and of this book that was written by God, I never forget the fact that I owe so much to the people who penned this. But Bill had three and a half years of sobriety. He was 43 years old when he, when he penned this book. I believe that the book is written by God Almighty. I believe that. You don't have to. That's okay. Because of its perfection and its timeless timeless manner. It tells me what to do, and it tells me how to do it in 2015 as readily as it would have in 1939 when it was published in April of 39. And it's no secret that after the ninth step are the so-called promises, the beautiful promises. We're not going to have time this morning to go into the promises in detail because I know also that they also have separate special editions where we do that. But uh, So I'm just going to Read them and, and, and if we are, I'm at the bottom of 83. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always, the key word there is always, materialize if we work for them. Again, if we work for them. There's nothing in this book that says now you get a free pass if we work for them. 
This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. That sentence, we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past, means that when you start cleaning up the past in step 8, you begin to do 10. You do not wait until you're done. You will eat, I promise you, because these amends will bring up emotions. The emotion buildup of fear of making the amends, the emotional buildup of the anger that you'll feel when you face Joe or Fred or Mary or Linda, it's going to catapult you into the food because the, the food is not the problem. It is the solution to the problem. And what is the problem? The pain that comes into our bodies, minds, and souls when we're not eating. And what causes the pain is the buildup of emotions. Now, a number of years ago, me and my friend Louisa, we did a special edition on step 10. Maybe one day we'll do another one. But the bottom line is step 10 is going to dissipate the buildup of these emotions so that they do not build up to that toxic level. And this is very important that I do 10 steps. I do many of them during the day. I don't do one or two. I do many because I'm a human being, and no matter, no matter how evolved my recovery may get, I will never rise above the level of a human being. And I'm going to have fear, and I'm going to have selfishness and anger. These things are going to come up. And when they do, I need to make a step 10 call immediately, immediately. It is vital that I see this line. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. And that's why I told that lady in New Jersey, no, you cannot call me when you're done with the steps because when you're done with the steps, you're going to be dead. I want to work the steps until they put me in the ground. I want to live until I die. I've died while I was alive. I want to live until I'm dead. I want to live right up till the last minute. I have spent decades with Kit Kats and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups in my mouth. I have been dead. I have been emasculated, humiliated, degraded. I have been the object of of scorn. I have been ridiculed. I have been excluded. I have been made to feel subhuman. I have wanted to kill myself. I have wanted to die. I have wanted to have a massive coronary and drop dead, and I prayed for that every day. I'm not giving this illness one more second of my life. Not another second am I going to give this illness. And I don't have to because I have a proven, workable method by which I can recover. Continue. Here's your basic instruction. So many people call me from all over this country and other countries. And they'll call me and they'll say, I worked the steps and I'm still eating. And I'll say, did you do step 10? No. Did you do 11? No. Did you do 12? No. No. These instructions are so simple that we, in our zeal to complicate things, we miss it. Here, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. What step did we use to deal with selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear? That's right, step four. You got the right answer. When these things crop up, not if, not should they, it says when. Why? Because they know you are human beings. When these things crop up, We ask God at once to remove them. What steps did we use to ask God to remove our defects? That's right, six and seven. We discuss them with someone immediately. Not wait till I get home. Not wait till I'm done at the gym. Not wait till I'm done at the car wash. Immediately. What step did we use to discuss someone with immediately? 
That's right. Step five, you're doing great. And make amends quickly if we've harmed anybody. What two steps did we use for that? That's right, eight and nine. Very good. So in this little sentences here, these little subparagraph here, we're doing four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Then we resolutely, resolutely means with purpose, turn our thoughts to someone we can help. What step looms in front of us? Twelve. That's right. Very good. You're doing great today. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. So in this little subparagraph, we're doing four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. I dare you to do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve every day, five, six, ten times a day, and eat candy bars. You can't do it. The program works too effectively. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. Sanity. Wow. I ceased fighting. The food is the most exhausting life in the world. I'm fighting the world. I'm fighting food. I'm either eating or not eating, eating or not eating. It's exhausting, and it beats me down, and I can't tolerate it anymore. And eventually, I eat again, and I have eaten truckloads of food to kill the pain of eating truckloads of food. I don't have to live that way anymore. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as if from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally and we will find that this has happened automatically. I urge you to work these steps. If you don't have a sponsor, we will get you one. I know that they have wonderful sponsors on this vision for you. I know that there are wonderful people who will help you. We will see, page 85, we will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We're neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. This is how we react as long as we keep fit spiritual condition. But let this go. Stop doing it. Internalize these emotions. Don't tell them to somebody else. Don't let them see the light of day. And you'll be walking around with a candy bar in your mouth before you can say two and two is four. Because the food is not the problem. It is the answer to the problem. And the problem is the pain that comes into our life as the result of not eating. And the pain comes from the buildup of emotions. All human beings have happiness. Sadness, jealousy, guilt, shame, remorse, anger. All human beings have these emotions. And as these emotions build and build and build and build, they will wake up the mental twist. The emotional side of the brain says, eat the food. The intelligence part of the brain says, no, no, no. We want to look good for the wedding. We want to look good for the bar mitzvah. We want to look good for the party. No, 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 we're not eating that way anymore. And the emotional part of the brain will lock horns with the intelligent part of the brain, and the emotional part of the brain will win every time. And we eat the food. And we tell ourselves that it will just be this one time that tomorrow we're going back on our diet, that tomorrow it will be different, that tomorrow we're going to get everything back in line. And we eat the food, and we trigger the allergy, and we pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, with a firm resolution not to eat that food again, and we will repeat that cycle over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, the mind telling you that the food makes perfect sense while the body ensures it does not. But what if I could find a way that these emotions do not build to the level where they become fatal, where they become dangerous? And that process of lowering the level of those emotions to a level where we do not find it necessary to eat 
is called recovery. And that's what this is all about, Charlie Brown. This is about lowering the level of these emotions through a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps so you do not find it necessary to seek the food out as a solution because the problem has been removed. This isn't just homework that we thought up to make you crazy. There's a method to every madness here. These emotions will not build to the level when you work these steps. Now, let's, let's take a look here at the 10-step prayer in this paragraph. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Stop doing the steps. You will eat again. It's guaranteed. Every day, not some days, not most days, every day is a day when we must, the key word is must, carry the visions of God's vision of God's will into all of our activities. Here's your 10-step prayer. I say this about a thousand times a day. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. Couldn't be more simple. We're going to get an 11-step prayer that's going to say the same thing, but different words. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly, constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. I feel God with me all the time. I know he's here. I know he's with me. Much has, But that takes work. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him, capitalized, who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions, not suggestions, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we have become God conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense, but we must go further, and that means more action. We're not done. We never get done. The symbol of Alcoholics Anonymous is a triangle, but outside the triangle is a circle. Recovery, unity, and service are the three branches of the, of the triangle. But the circle means a never-ending pursuit of our spiritual condition. The circle has no beginning. The circle has no end. The circle, very important. Now let's go to the bottom of page 85. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. Now when this book was written, Bill was 43 years old. He had three and a half years of sobriety. I'm 61 years old. I have 16 and a half years of, of, of abstinence. I'm lucky if I can send out a coherent text message. But this book was written by God, I believe. You don't have to agree with me. That's your choice. That's okay. It's not, there's no right or wrong answer. I believe that the book was written by God. But it was written in such a way because Bill didn't really know that much about prayer and meditation at the time that it was penned. <laughs> Thank God he didn't. Because if he did, he would have written this in such a way that I might not be able to follow it. But it's so simple. It's so simple. Let's take a look. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. What is the proper attitude? The proper attitude is that there is a God and it's not me and that God is personal to me and I have a description in my mind of what God is and what God is not and I work that out with my sponsor. I know that there is a God and it's not me. I believe that there is a God that loves me very much and I believe that God is powerful, and I believe that God is personal, and I believe that God is perfect. Now, you don't have to believe any of those things. That's okay. I'm not telling you what to believe, and I'm not here to proselytize my religion or my God or anything. But that is what I must believe, or I'd be walking around with an almond joy bar in my mouth. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. That means I have to have a belief that there is a power greater than me. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can <clears throat> excuse me, make some definite and valuable suggestions. Now, 
You have the nighttime section of step 11 first. Why is that? Because it is assumed that you've been doing 10 steps all day long. It is assumed that you have been following the instructions and that you have been doing step 10 all through the day. We constructively review our day. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? What steps did we use to deal with resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear? Good answer. I like that. That's very good. Steps four and ten. Do we owe an apology? What two steps did we use to make an apology? Eight and nine. We also use step ten because in step ten it says when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So we've done four, ten, and we've done six, and we've done uh, eight and nine. Have we kept something to ourselves which should be discussed with another person at once? Step five, step ten. Were we kind and loving toward all? Remember it says in step ten, love and tolerance of others is our code. So we see the cycle of repetition. And when God wants us to understand something in the book, he doesn't put it in there once. He didn't put it in there one time. He puts it in again and again and again. On my Saturday morning big book study that we do here in Scottsdale, Arizona, we talk about the pathology of all these ideas. If you're ever in Arizona, give me a call. I would love for you to stop by. We, we look at the pathology. We look very in-depth at where these ideas are repeated throughout the book. What could we have done better? Now, when we read that line, what could we have done better? Remind yourself that a hammer to your head is not one of the tools of recovery. Tony? A hammer, a hammer to Tony? your head is not one of the tools of recovery. Somebody's unmuted. Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time, or were we thinking of what we could do for others, of what we could pack into the stream of life? And once again, for the umpteenth time, we are told that we must add to the life. We must pack into the life, not to take. We have a new employer. We're here to serve him. But we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. On awakening, this is in your morning. This is something I do every morning. Let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. I email my sponsor every single day. What, are, what am I going to do today? What are my goals? What are my aspirations today? Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Now, that means that I'm going to have a shift in my thinking because my old life that was full of candy wrappers and pizza boxes was full of what am I going to get out of this and what's in this for me. And today... I look first at what I can add to life. How can I help another person? How can I love another person? What can I do? I sponsor a lot of people. I get a lot of calls. When I'm in the wrong frame of mind, those calls can be a nuisance. When I'm in the right frame of mind, those calls can be the most wonderful miracle of life. Every one of those people broadens my horizon and adds to my life. If I gave them as much as they gave me, I would give them so much. They do more for me than I could ever describe to you. And service is the most wonderful, wonderful way of life. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. We, uh, we, here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought or a decision. We relax and take it easy. When I have an idea that is self-will, it is going to meet up with all these, all these difficulties. When it's God's will, it just kind of flows. It just kind of flows. It just kind of goes downstream. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. What used to be the hunch or, an, or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. 
being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely on it. I trust God. We usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be, that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We ask especially for freedom from self-will, and we are careful to make no requests for ourselves only. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that, and it doesn't work. You can see why. Now, before we read another word, if you want to, and you're in front of a big book right now, if you're driving, if you're doing things, whatever, then obviously you can't do this. But what I'd like you to do is go back to page 11. I'd like, excuse me, not 11, 13, I'm sorry, 13. Okay. Page 13 is in Bill's story, and it says, I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself, except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. Do you see the parallel between page 13 and Bill's story? Now we can go back to page 87 and the very paragraph that we just read is the same exact idea because God doesn't put things in here once. He puts them in there many times. And the more important the idea, the more times he'll repeat it. Page 87, if circumstances warrant, we ask our wives or friends to join us in morning meditation. If we belong to a religious denomination, which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. If not members of religious bodies, we sometimes select and memorize a few set prayers which emphasize the principles we have been discussing. What are the principles? The principles are the steps. There are many helpful books also. Suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest, minister, or rabbi. Be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they offer. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated. I go to meetings here in North Scottsdale at the North Scottsdale Fellowship Club with a guy, and this is his mantra. And when he's sponsoring anybody, they run around going, we pause when agitated. I can always tell when he's sponsoring somebody. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action, we constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. And this is important because my brain is wired. What am I going to do about this? How am I going to get around this? What, how am I, gonna, blah, 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 blah. I can't live that way and not eat. It's too painful. Let God. Let God. I, I, not long ago, I did a retreat in Mobile, Alabama. Not long ago. And I was stuck in the Houston airport for 14 hours. 14 hours I sat in the Houston airport during a storm. And for 14 hours, I watched people swearing at 25-year-olds, throwing their luggage, yelling F you at their spouses, screaming, drinking, eating compulsively. And I could just watch this and just say, God's will, God's will. Now, I was exhausted, absolutely exhausted, By the time I got to Mobile, it was already Saturday. They had a listen on the podcast from Los Angeles uh, for the first part of the retreat. And um, I got there Saturday. I was was like a dish rag. I left my house about a quarter to six on Friday, and I got to Mobile, Alabama at 2 a.m. Saturday. It was a nightmare as far as, you know, fatigue goes. But I just kept saying, God's in charge, God's in charge, God's in charge. And sure enough, I got there, I got home, I'm fine. Thy will be done. We are in, I'm on page 88. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily. We are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. Burning up energy is the, one of the understatements of the year. It's exhausting. I can't run the world, but I try. Now, here's the most important paragraph you'll ever read in your life. It's a short paragraph, but it's very key. It says, it works. It really does. 
this works. Stop fighting it. Stop editing it. Stop trying to change it. Stop seeing things that are not there and not seeing things that are there. Work the program. Put the other literature away. Put the Narishkite away. The Narishkite is the foolishness. Put all the, the other methods of doing it away. Do it out of the big book. You don't need anything else. We alcoholics are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us in the simple way we have just outlined. But this is not all. There is action and more action. Faith without works is dead. There it is again. The next chapter is entirely devoted to step 12. Now, before I go, and we go into our question and answer period, I just want to say this, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. This is the most wonderful way of life imaginable for me. I cannot imagine a life more fantastic than this. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't have a mansion. I don't have a million dollars. I don't have a pony. There's a list of things I do not have. I own a business. There's, there's you know, we, I've struggled. I'm making a fraction of what I used to make. Now, those are all true things that I just told you. But I have a life today that is full of service. And I have a life today that does not include compulsive overeating or thoughts about it. I've lost a little over 500 pounds, and I have 16 and a half years of abstinence. I'm alive. I walk. I swim. I live. Okay. Um, Leah, I'm going to throw it open for Q&A, and I'm done. Harlan, thank you so much for such a powerful and thorough presentation this morning. Thanks for sharing your personal experience with the implementation of these steps in your life. Thanks for the sense of humor and the Yiddish lesson also. (laughs) Thank you so much. Harlan's uh, contact information will be given at the conclusion of this recording, so stay tuned for that. We are going to now transition into a Q&A, question and answers. If you have a question, press star 1 to unmute and identify yourself, please. Questions only, please. Carol G? I didn't catch your name. Hi, this is Pam. I asked a question. Pam, but I heard someone before Pam. Sorry? It's Carol, Carol G? Carol G, okay. Carol G, (laughs) Pam, who else? Michelle. Michelle. Anyone else for this grouping? Don't be shy. The water's warm. Jump in. Okay, let's start with Carol G, please. Thank you. Thank you, Leia. Uh, good morning, Harlan. Thank you so much. Good morning, much. Carol. Hi. Uh, I so thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, Carol G. Recovered Compulsive Overeater, you said during your share um, that it was very frightening for Dr. Bob at Step 9 because of his reputation. Mm-hmm. And I've seen this become a block for so many sponsees, and I've even experienced this myself. The idea of breaking your anonymity um, seems to be so frightening to people. They've often gone back to the food. I wondered if you could just unpack that um, okay. prayer on seventy nine or something, please. Thank you. Well, let's let's con- let's disconnect a break of anonymity with amends. Let's disconnect that. You do not have to break your anonymity. You can tell them that you're working on your life and that you are a compulsive overeater and you will not recover unless you take these actions. You do not have to implicate Overeaters Anonymous, number one. Number two, what you're describing, again, is not a problem with step nine. You're describing a problem with step two. If I have a God that I'm willing to believe in, if I have a power greater than myself that I'm willing to believe in, now I didn't say I believe in, I said willing to believe in, then I should have no real problem doing this because God is going to see me through. God is going to have such power, 
such magnificent power that it will overcome anything that is human like this. And I do not have to think for one second that God is not more powerful than this very human situation that I'm facing of making this amends. So once again, when a person is struggling in nine or they are struggling in four or struggling in any step, 99.999% of the time, you go back with them if if you're the sponsor or if you're the sponsee. It is a step two issue. So I hope that answers it, but you're, you're, you're linking up a break of anonymity with step nine, and there is no reason for anybody to think that by doing a step nine that they're going to break their anonymity, unless they want to. You do not have to tell the people you're a member of Overeaters Anonymous. You can tell them that you are trying to straighten out your life and that in so doing you are a compulsive overeater and this is part of your process and this is something that you need and want to do. I hope that answers it. Thanks, Carol G. Pam, your turn. Uh, the, hi, I'm Pam, a compulsive overeater. The part of the presentation I heard was wonderful, and I've heard you before, Holland, and it's just very moving. The question is, how simple in your mind, how simple can abstinence be? In other words, in your opinion, can one simply say, I won't have this, I won't have that, I'll turn to God for everything else, or do you believe that it has to be the more formalized, weighted, and measured, etc.? That's my question. I do, not, I do not believe that you can just be abstinent. If I just said I'm not going to eat sugar or I said to myself I'm not going to eat, you know, whatever it is, I, that's not abstinent. That to me is called zebra meat abstinence. I'm, I'm not eating zebra meat, but I can eat five cakes a day. No. I have to have a structure to my food. I have to have a boundary, um, you know, eating a yak for lunch is not, is not abstinent. I must have a boundary. That's me. But, again, I'm not a restrictor. I'm not uh, anorexic in this area. I'm not bulimic in this area. There are people with different needs. And one of the things that is different about OA from AA and, and all the other ones is we do not completely abstain from our addictive situation there. We have to eat food. But what kind of food, what amounts of food, that is another matter. So, no, I am not one of these people that says, well, I just don't eat sugar. If that works for you and you're listening to this, God bless you. I I take my hat off to you. It wouldn't work for me. It wouldn't work for me. I'd be eating two pieces of chicken for lunch, the left half and the right half. <clears throat> I hope that does it. Thank you, Pam, for the question. Michelle, your turn. Star one to unmute Michelle. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Thank you, Leia. Arlen, thank you so much for your share and your presentation this morning. Inspiring. Um, I'm Michelle, a recovered compulsive reader in Delaware. Question about the pause. The pause when agitated and doubtful and the surrender around that. Um, your um, example of being in, stuck in the airport all that time and how you found some serenity there. Um, and I just, I was wondering how that pause has evolved for you possibly over the years through your recovery. Um, I know that my, uh, the awareness of self coming in very quickly when um, I don't want to do something I'm being asked to do. And um, I am working on on the pause. So I was wondering if you had anything to share about that or you could elaborate. As I, as I do the program more, the pause becomes more natural. But at first, it's very unnatural. My mind will snap to a solution. My mind will snap to something like, I'm going to say this or I'm going to say that. And the responses are very quick, you know, F you or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. But as I start doing it more and more and more and become conscious of that power greater than myself, then I am going to have that pause and I'm going to say, no, let's not start engaging in the luggage toss. Let's not start engaging in verbally abusing a 25-year-old because they can't get me on a certain flight. 
there's a storm. There's nothing she can do. And calling her a witch and throwing your luggage and yelling at your wife in the Houston airport is not going to get me what I want. It's not going to get me what I want. I want to do God's will. I want to do God's work. I don't want to, I don't want to show a 25-year-old how horribly I can swear. So that pause becomes more accentuated as I exercise my steps more and more and more through my life. And my responses change over time from that immediate F you, that immediate reaction to one of just pause and let God have his way. And that happens with work. I have to work at it. I hope that answers it. <sighs> Thank you, Michelle. Who else has a question this morning for Harlan? Star one to unmute to identify yourself. Your presentation was so thorough, Harlan. <laughs> I was so good, yes. There's no question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Lesson you. registered. <laughs> yeah, We're ready really. to get Devorah. off the phone and recover. Who has a question? Devorah. Hi, Devorah. Anyone else? This is a great opportunity. We get questions all the time. Hi, it's Susie. Susie. Anyone else? Keep in mind that if a question's on your mind, it's probably on the mind of at least a dozen others. I'm sorry? My name is Tara. May Tara. I join in the Hello, line? my name is Terry. I didn't catch the last person. Carol H. Um, Terry. Carol H. Okay. So let's Issy go with K. Susie K. We're going to go with nope. uh, Issy K. <laughs> okay. Got it. And I'm Terry. I'm Terry. Terry. Got it. Okay. We're going to start with Devora and then Susie. Devora, go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Leia. Good morning, Harlan. Thank you so much. Um, Thank I you. enjoyed you thoroughly. I, I heard you in New Jersey. I was one of the uh, people there listening to you, and I gained a lot then. And as of now, it's you know, amazing. And uh, really, thank you. A very thorough presentation. And I just, you know, I know that this is um, the steps to go quickly. We don't want to spend years on it. And, and so what happens when I'm working with someone now, and she's been abstinent and she was writing, uh, but she picked up the food. So what mm -hmm. do we do? We, she picked up. She picked up during her fourth sex writing. Mm -hmm. What do we do then? Do we go back? Do I? What? What? What do we do? Do we? I okay, absolutely. I absolutely would go back and reinforce the doctor's opinion. I would absolutely mm -hmm. go back and have her do another job description or another description of a power greater than herself that she's willing to believe in. And where you see people picking up in four or you see people picking up in nine, they are really picking up because of a lack of two. They're really picking up because of two. If the other thing I would say to you is examine something with the person. Are you still consuming food that is triggering the physical allergy? Because that happens too. But normally speaking, when you see someone that will stop their recovery in four and nine, they are really struggling with a power greater than themselves. Do they really, are they really willing to believe that there is a power greater than themselves? Be they atheists, be they agnostic, be they whatever, be they believers, it is not the point. Are you willing to believe that there's a power greater than yourself? If you are, then you can recover. If you're not, then there's nothing we can do. If you're going to put that faith in a, in a, in a human being, you're in trouble. If you're going to put that faith in money, you're in trouble. It has to be a power greater than yourself. And that's what I would look at. Thank you, Devora, for that question. Susie, your turn. Hi. Thank you, Harlan, so much. This is Susie calling from Jerusalem. And oh. I, uh, I missed what you said about um, the eighth step. Could you... Uh, say again you know, the importance of the eighth step. The eighth step is vital because it demonstrates a willingness. And there are people that I cannot make amends to. They're dead or I cannot find them. Even with all the Internet at my disposal, even with all the tools that I have in, in 2015, 
I just can't find these people. And so there are people that I hurt, and there are people whom I would love to make amends to, like my mother and my father. My mother and father were dead before I came to my first meeting. So I cannot go back and make amends to them, but I am willing to. And what I do on their birthdays and on my birthday is I write them letters. I also pray for their souls. I also love them when I do service. I think of them, and I know that in their hearts they are very happy that I am doing service for Overeaters Anonymous. So the eighth step, or this willingness, is a tremendously overlooked concept and an overlooked step. I must be willing, and that is so important, and that's, that's, uh, that's how the eighth step has worked in my life. I'm willing to make amends to my mother. Should I die today or should I live today? Either way, I'm going to make amends to my mother, and I'm going to act in a way that I know she would want for me. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> Tara, your turn. Hi. Hello. Tara? Tara. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, This question uh, came came to me, and in the night when, um, you know, bothersome thoughts, come into our minds about things we certainly have no control over, <laughs> you know. Um, um, it would like to do a 10th step, right? Mm-hmm. Like ask God to remove the selfishness and, um, you know, I guess you would, you, but you, it's in the middle of the night, so you're not going to call someone unless, unless it's so, you know, terrible that you have to, um, you know, reach out and do something. But if it's just, you know, people always wake up with that in the middle of the night kind of anxiety and just thinking about things that they, you know, are powerless about. Um, Do you have a suggestion for, I mean, I, I, a lot of times will put a talk on in my mind so I don't think about it anymore mm-hmm. and, and also pray. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, would you suggest getting up and, like, doing something, being of service? Or? I would do something as the situation dictates. Now, what I've also done is I've armed myself with people to call from as far away as Liverpool, England, to as far away as uh, California or whatever. So there's people in my role, in my uh, phone that are eight hours ahead. There's people in my phone that are, you know, on the same time zone. There's people that are two and three hours ahead, depending, one hour ahead, depending. And uh, I do the best I can. I pray and I write and I ask God for direction. I ask God for, for specific direction in each individual matter. And that's what I do. And that's what I do. But you have at your disposal an easier way to recover today than ever. You have people on this Vision for You website whose numbers are listed that are in Israel. Some of them have American phone numbers. You have people from Europe that have American phone numbers. I believe there are people from all time zones in this country that have numbers on here. So it's actually easier to reach people. You can, you can call many of us any time, night, or day. You're not going to disturb us. It's not like the old phones, you know, the jangle on the table. It's a cell phone. It's, it's very easy. So it's easier to recover today. It's easier to reach out today than it's ever been. Many of these people in Europe have American phone numbers. You can reach them readily. And that's what I do. Thank you, Tara. Carolyn H. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Carolyn. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Holland. I really enjoyed this. I have a really important question. A lot Mm -hmm. of people are pushing fast-paced big book, get through it in a very short time. And mm-hmm. when we get to the fourth step, just touch base and run through it, see the pattern, and you're done. I want to know what your opinion is on that and whether or not people need to do a very long, thorough fourth step. They need to do a thorough. I don't know about you know anything else. They need to do a thorough one where you see people getting paralyzed in step four is they want to do a perfect one. 
And the word perfect does not appear in the book. A perfect one, no. God is not going to put my fourth step on his refrigerator. It's fearless and thorough and move on. If you want to get the work done, you should be able to do it in a day or two at the most, at the most. If you've got a pencil, a pad, you're ready to roll. There's no reason on earth it should take all that long. You know exactly who you're mad at. You know exactly who or what you fear. You know why you fear them. And you also know the sexual harms you've done other people. If something gets past you, honestly gets past you, we have step 10 looming in the future where we can catch some of that stuff. So the most important thing is to get started and get it going. And once it starts going, you become inert. You get, you, you're get a, um, a person with inertia. You keep going, you keep going, and it'll, it'll be fine. If you're going to stop and hesitate and get paralyzed, then you're in trouble. Then you're in trouble. The most important thing is do it. And there are, there are things we do to kill ourselves, and one of them is we get paralyzed. And we get paralyzed because we want analysis is paralysis. Just go. Just do it. That's my answer. Thank you, Carolyn. If he K. If he K, it's your turn. Can you guys hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, um, good morning, Lydia. Thank you for your service. Um, Harlan, thank you again for your lead. I had a quick question. Uh, I do realize that you have, we have, we do have easy access to like numbers of a whole bunch of people off of uh, the Vision for You uh, member list. But for me, it's the kind of thing where sometimes I call people and I literally do not know what to say. It's almost like I feel like it's, I'm, it's pretty. I'm having these trivialized conversations with them where it's like, okay, it's like a step up above. Oh, do you, how's the weather in in Arizona or what's going on? And it's like, after a while, I just get like a little, um, I don't know, a little saddened because I'm like, what's the point? I'm not making connections to people. And I do realize that as you go along your program, you do need to build up a network of people. So I just Mm -hmm. feel like, do you have any um, suggestions for being able to, make a, a, a true connection to people or at least get to know more people. Cause that, that for me is like a big, huge issue for me. And it's like service, service, the number, service. Oh my God. The number one thing I would say to you is listen to and attend a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. Number two, make the call. You don't have to ask me what the weather's like in Arizona. I'll tell you hot, very hot. You can ask me that today. It's going to be 105, very hot. And never mind the Narish kite about a dry heat. It's hot. I'll teach you a Yiddish word. Haste, haste with. Okay, now you don't have I don't you don't have to make small talk with me. You call me, you anybody that's in recovery, it's not just me, it's anybody. There's many, many people on these vision for you websites and at, at your face to face meetings. Call them, I'm scared, I'm angry, I'm hurt, I'm this, I'm that. Get to the point. Get to the point. You had no trouble asking your question. Get to the point and tell them what's going on. Then you'll get to your part in it, and then you'll move on and 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 you'll do your steps. Hope Thank that you. answers it. Thanks, Iffy, for your question, Terry H. Terry, perhaps it wasn't Terry H. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for um, your service today. Uh, It was amazing to hear you. Um, So I wanted my two questions, maybe just short answers. One is um, when you pray, I notice that people pray for I want a the pony. Please give me the mm-hmm. pony, God. Mm-hmm. But um, some traditions are, you know, you you said that will be done. You know, show mm-hmm. me your will. But but but, what do you think of people, you know, praying for? I want to win the lottery. I want to win a pony. I want that boyfriend. It's um, not up to I, me to think anything. You know, uh, it, it's their right to pray that. I I want to pray for God's will. I want to pray for the things he wants me to have. Um, 
uh, if people want to pray for a pony or, you know, I wish I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning or whatever it is, uh, God bless you. But I've learned that those kind of prayers seldom go answered. I've learned over time, pray for the next right thing. Take the next indicated action. I've learned over time to pray for God's will. Yeah, in the back of my mind, I'd still like uh, a girlfriend. I'd still like money. I'd still like this. I'm human. I'm a human being. No matter how evolved my recovery gets, Carrie, I will never rise above the level of a human being. But for right now, how do I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. How do I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. That's the 10th step. I say it a million times a day. Thank you. And the last thing is, when the fourth step, when I've done it, and I've been in the program a long time, and I've done, I've had to do steps, and I'm in numerous programs. I've done them again and again and again. Um, I, because um, I started when I was like 20, and I'm now in my 50s. So you know, anyways, but um, I, and I'm in many programs, like I said. But I, I want to know when you, um, when I've done the four steps, you know, I. I still find that I have hurt myself the most. Um, how do you make amends yourself? Living in a recovered life, living a re- living in recovery, working the steps, doing the things that the big book tells me to do is the best way I can make amends to me. There's going to be three basic byproducts of working the steps. You're going to get right with God. You're going to get right with yourself and right with your fellow human being. And in doing so, you're going to have the best life possible. The way I make amends to myself is I work the steps. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Thank you, Terry. Terry, what's the first letter of your last name, please? S. S. Okay, thank you, Terry. S. Can I ask a question, please? One moment. One moment. Harlan, we want to respect your time frame. What? Shall about, we invite uh, again? What time do you need to be off? Uh, let's give it till a quarter to the hour. Let's let's. It's seven thirty-seven here in Arizona. Let's give it till seven forty-five. How's that? Got it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, who else has a question for Harlan? Please, let's make the most of our time. Just questions. Start yes. one to unmute. Hi. Yes, this is Arlene A. Arlene, who else? Maggie H. Okay. And one other. Hello, Christy B. I, I didn't catch that last name. Christy B. Okay. Better Okay, terrific. Arlene, go ahead. Okay, I think, I'm not sure, I think the question might have been answered in the other questions, but I wouldn't be honoring myself if I didn't ask for myself. Um, I'm, you know, I've, I've recently picked up, so I've gone back to step one, and as, and as a result of this incredible presentation today, I'm going to be working a lot on step two as well. But um, what to do, like what to do physically when confronted with sudden aggression? I, like you were saying, you know, in, in the airport thing, and that's something that you were able to observe. But if somebody were to come and personally be aggressive to you in a moment. I very often have failed to um, respond in a way that pleases me in the end so that normally, you know, I, you know, not only have I not handled the situation maybe according to the way, you know, the steps would suggest, but I've also, you know, I feel as though I've been a disappointment to myself. So I've tr- I think I've tried the pause but usually it's such a sudden turn of aggression that mm-hmm. I don't even have time for my brain to usually, I want to say, click in. It's almost like a physiological, automatic reaction of fight and flight. Mm-hmm. Work at it. <laughs> Work at it. Work at it. Okay. And that's the answer to your question. Look okay. at that pause. Okay. <laughs> there you go, Arlene. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Maggie H., your turn. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. On page 77 in the direct amends, mm-hmm. uh, that last paragraph, with a person we dislike, take the bit mm-hmm. in our teeth, it is harder to go to an enemy than to a friend, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling. That 
part always kind of catches me, confessing mm-hmm. our former ill feeling. How would we do that without seeming to blame? Again, it's, the, it's, it's, what, it's how you do it. And, and what I would say to the person is, you know, because I'm so addle-brained with the food and because I have so many defects, I really, I really had a period of time where I resented you strongly. And the reason I resented you is because my defects were at work, not yours. And I just want to let you know that now that I'm in recovery and now that I see you as another human being, I can love you, I can like you, I can respect you. Because what are we really talking about here? We're talking about if you spot it, you got it. And if it makes you mad, you got it bad. And when I see these defects of character in other people that are making me angry, it's because it's the me in them that I see that I don't like. And that's what we're really dealing with. So there's nothing dishonest or duplicitous about what I'm answering. I've had defects. I was under, under the gun of my own defects. And because of my defects, I looked at you and I resented you. But I want you to know that it was me and it was not you. And now that I'm in recovery, I can honestly look at you and respect you and love you. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, no Maggie H. And our final question comes from Christy B. Please. Uh, is that my turn, Christy? Please, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I share my Are you there? Go ahead. Yeah, we're I shared with my sponsor um, something that um, I did, and she didn't believe me that I did it. And um, she went on and on about how my mind makes things up, and uh, I'm sure that this actual thing happened, and um, it's weighing heavily on my heart. And I know that someday I'll need to make an amends for when I get to that point. And I don't know what to do to convince her that this actually happened. I would stop trying and leave it up to God. <laughs> I, I don't know how to convince somebody of something that they do not believe. I really don't. I wouldn't have mm-hmm. a clue as to how to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you wanted me to believe that, that donkeys could fly, I don't know how you would go about convincing me, except if you showed me that they could fly. I, I don't really know. Um I, I don't really know I the particulars. There's something that I well, I'd have to talk to privately. I don't know. Are you giving your phone number out at the end of the meeting? You'd have to what? Are you giving your phone number out at the end of the meeting? Yes, yes, I'll give it out at the end of the meeting. But I really don't have anything. I I, I couldn't enlighten or expand on what I'm telling you at all. I really couldn't. I mean, you 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 just may have to accept the fact that the person doesn't believe you and move on with your life. Thank you, Christy B. For I'll take one. More, I'll take one more, Leah. There's two minutes oh. left. I'll take one more. One okay, more. one more. Let's go. One more. My, my, Who? My name is Chris K. I was in the. the Chris uh, K. Go right ahead. Okay. Just with okay. a question. Just with a question, please. Hey, um, thank you, Harlan, for a um, great um, talk. I got so much out of that. I hmm. came into OA in the '79. Me too. Yeah, it seems like it was only there was only one OA. I came back in 2004, and there were very many different types of meetings and, and programs. And you know, I think it was confusing to me. It still is. And I think for any newcomer, that would be really, really confusing to you know different food plans and different types of meetings, different um, mm-hmm. restrictions, and it's just really confusing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I want to go back to the old OA. You know, just Plain old Overeaters Anonymous. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what is your idea about that? Do you have any? I think that as OAers, we are very addicted to reinventing the wheel. We love reinventing the wheel. And there's no 12 step way of life more confusing than OA. There's all kinds of offshoot groups. There's offshoot groups for people with two left feet, and there's offshoot groups for people that like to stand on their head, and there's all kinds of OA offshoot groups from. And I'm not denigrating any of them, but I think that if we look back to the forward to the second edition, and in the forward to the second edition, it very simply says that of 100 people that came into Overeaters Anonymous, 50 of them got sober at once. 
that really tried. And when they say they really tried, they mean they worked it out of the big book. And that's why I love A Vision for You. And that's why I love the big book meetings of Overeaters Anonymous that I attend at the North Scottsdale Fellowship Club. Now, if 50% got sober at once and another of the remaining 50, 25% got sober, that's 75% recovery. And of the remaining 25, some of them showed marked improvement. But let's just say that that's 75% recovery. Now, I've been to Overeaters Anonymous retreats and conventions in most of the states in this union. I've lived in Chicago, and I've lived in Eugene, Oregon, and I've lived in Scottsdale, Arizona my whole life. Those, those are the only three places I've lived, so I've attended meetings in all those places. You, we can't talk about 75% recovery. We can't talk about 50% recovery. We can't talk about 10% recovery. We are lucky if one and a half to 2% of the people that are stumbling into Overeaters Anonymous are recovering because we are getting away from the big book and we are getting all enthusiastic about tools and we're getting enthusiastic about all these other various things and we're getting into all kinds of things which we shouldn't get into. I think if we go back to the big book and we knock it off and we get back into unity, then we'll all be better off. We'll all be better off. And the recovery rates in our fellowship will be higher. The meetings will grow because people will see a recovery that they want to latch on to. There are meetings of Overeaters Anonymous today that if they didn't read the preamble, and they didn't read how it works out of the big book, you wouldn't know where you were because they're talking about anything except the program of recovery in the big book. And they're talking about anything except the illness and the recovery therefrom. They have become meetings where people come to dump. There are meetings where people come to tell us about what happened at the veterinarian's office and the dry cleaning office and the dental office. We bring our mess to a sponsor and our message of recovery to the meeting, and you'll see some of these meetings with five people and ten people swell and grow to 40 and 50 and 100 people. And the more we get away from the big book and the more we want to go into other forms of stuff, other forms of literature and other subject matters, this is what you see today. You see the blind leading the blind. You see people with no recovery sponsoring people with no recovery. And it says in the big book, and not in the big book, it says in the other big, big book, if the blind leadeth the blind, they shall both fall into a ditch. So I'm glad you asked that question. I think that question is one that I'm glad was asked. Well, let's get back to the big book and let's knock off the Narishkite. Let's knock off all the sedriddled Narishkites. Let's knock all the Mishagas out of, out of the window. And let's get back to the big book and we can recover together even though we may have different beliefs and we may have different food plans, we can come together in recovery. And you'll see some differences when you, if you see that day come. You'll see conventions and you'll see retreats and you'll see meetings with the type of numbers that they would have in AA. I hope that does it. Thank you, Chris K., for that question. And, of course, thank you, Harlan, thank you, for Lance. your message this morning, for your time and your effort. Of course, this has been recorded and uh, will be archived and uh, utilized over and over again. A Vision for You does get 1,500 to 2,000 hits a day. So this, this hopefully uh, will be helpful to so many. Thank you very much. And I'm going to close the meeting the way A Vision for You always closes its meeting, and that's with the reading from page 164 from the the chapter entitled A Vision for You. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us.
Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then.